So, hello everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Recovery, uh, a series that we began a year ago in March, uh, asking the question after the pandemic was declared, what is a library if the building is closed? This kind of existential question just popped up when you go, well, what, what are we doing now? And what's going on? And so it went from what we would have called libraries in reaction, just trying to you know, understand the basics of what was happening to then a little bit first stage organization of libraries in response. Okay, we can do this, we can't do that. We can do curbside, nobody can come into the building. All these different things were being sort of put in place as procedures. So we began to learn more and more about what the pandemic and this virus would allow us to do, which is just stunning how, uh, how much was changed overnight. I mean, civilization was just upended. It, we've never seen anything uh, like that it's happened so quickly and, and so massively. And then uh, last fall, as things were looking better, we thought after the, after the summer uh, rise, we, we renamed this as Library and Recovery. So trying to look forward not expecting we're going back to what it was before, but that some new new paradigm would take shape. And in that, it would be an opportunity and a challenge for libraries to, to recover and become something new, perhaps. Anyway, the point is that it's, that it's uh, uh, progressed through almost weekly series of interesting uh, sessions and uh, speakers, two of which we have today. Uh, if I could ask uh, people to mute their their screens, it'd be helpful. Uh, did that change? The screen change? Thank you. Uh, so we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. My name is Don Means. I'm the director there. Uh, our partner in this series, uh, the, that, who is hosting and recording these sessions, is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutes, uh, based in The Hague. Den Haag uh, in the Netherlands. And at the controls is our uh, faithful partner, Stephen Weiber, who heads public policy for IFLA, the international organization of national libraries and national library associations, representing roughly 400,000 public libraries around the world and a couple of million school libraries, all important institutions. Uh, today's session, Session 51, session 51, Smart City AI. Uh, we've bravely uh, subtitled this the mechanics, economics, and ethics of next generation public infrastructures. So I hope that's not too much of a challenge for our speakers. Maybe it's obvious to them. We'll find out shortly. Uh, Ellen Goodman, professor of law at Rutgers there is a, a longtime associate. Uh, I. Uh, I read a, a piece by Ellen, I don't know how many years ago, talking about the interdependencies of infrastructures. You know, one of these things I'd never kind of thought about, but uh, how, you know, one depends on another. The most obvious, I guess, to us, especially what we're doing right now is how uh, the uh, electrical infrastructure uh, is necessary for the internet infrastructure. And as we learn, Almost every infrastructure is becoming dependent on both of these infrastructures, both electrification and uh, so-called ICT. And so that, that is, that's all being done for the usual you know, cost efficiencies and controls and, and monitoring and, and the rest of it. Uh, but it introduces a level of complexity when you have these interdependencies and you have more possibilities for, for failures at different points. Uh, so that's a new vulnerability, not to mention, you know, kind of uh, intentional interferences. Uh, we saw a huge example of this in the Texas freeze recently, and there was no water because there was no electricity. Now that is not good. We also have who is uh, also, I've known Deb for a long time. We've been in the, in the broadband world for, for years and years. Deb is a leader in, in this field and in, in, Smart cities and now since my internet connection's unstable. Please mute. Please mute whoever you are. Uh, and uh, Deb is now a practitioner. We're going to hear about what she's actually doing, rather than kind of thinking about stuff and talking about policy. She's actually uh, doing specific projects. 
Uh, first, we're going to do our COVID report, which is going to be short today, but this is kind of the backdrop for this whole series. So we talk about how it's progressing and all these are recorded uh, and I should have mentioned uh, 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 and archived on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net that was on the first slide. And so all of those are uh, there now on YouTube. They're transcribed and translated into a dozen languages. Uh, and they actually have kind of tracked the history of what's what's gone on for the past year, now approaching year and a half of this pandemic as a, uh, as a sequence of, of uh, phases and, and responses we've gone through. So this thing is better and worse, as we've seen. It's, it's, uh, it's mostly better now in the U.S. I mean, these vaccines are just phenomenal development in such a short amount of time. Uh, I mean, I, I say short amount of time. They've been working on this particular uh, technology for uh, you know, decades, I understand. But it just came to be applied in just record time. I mean, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. These things are not easy. And yet, somehow, we have them. And they work. They work to a large extent. Um, we're not entirely clear how long they last, or uh, especially the question about variants, which is a big question. It's a really big question. So we just, we're just starting to feel kind of comfortable in the US here. We're mostly vaccinated. At least half the population is, is vaccinated. And so we're kind of you know hanging out again. And that's, that's great. But at the same time, uh, the virus is exploding. COVID is exploding in places we expected to happen early on in uh, developing countries that have, you know, uh, rudimentary or, or less. We thought we had a sophisticated health system until it actually got challenged by the by the pandemic. But now that's happening around the world, and so these are these are play. Every individual that has this disease is effectively its own laboratory for mutations. And if you have, you know, enough hundreds of millions of those, uh, you're going to come up with some interesting things. The, the virus is constantly changing. The vaccines are static. So you have this uh, kind of challenge, which the, which the viruses are, are built to do, and that's to navigate around obstacles. They're kind of like the internet in that way. So we just don't know. It looks like boosters are, are on the horizon, but the point is, we are not out of this uh, by a long shot, and we best not rest on our laurels. Uh, wanted to take a, a couple of minutes today to introduce uh, a new project uh, that uses the Starlink system, Starlink Low Earth Orbit Satellite Constellation that uh, is going up uh, 60 satellites at a time, which is just mind blowing to me. Uh, I mean, I've been a, a space cadet since I was a kid and just to see these things taking place is really stunning. Uh, I'm no engineer, but even just the, the, the lay version of the engineering involved in creating a rocket company, creating a, a constellation of thousands of satellites that then talk to each other and to the ground uh, is just really something. Now, what that means is an open question. You know, I'm not saying this is totally a good thing. We may be building Skynet for all I know. We just don't know how this is going to come out, but it's happening. That's that's a fact. It is happening. And so as a result of that, uh, Gigabit Libraries has uh, engaged with Starlink uh, to pioneer, really, uh, enterprise licenses. So far, all the licenses that have been handed out, some 10,000 or so, they say, are, are beta licenses to residential users. That's who this system has been principally built for. People in remote locations that have poor broadband infrastructure. Uh, they say they're not trying to compete with, you know, DSL in Chicago or wherever. These are really the harder to reach places, which is what these satellites do. And uh, so they, because they're close to the earth, you know, less than, less than uh, 500 kilometers up as opposed to 30 something thousand kilometers for geostationary uh, they have a they have a, a short round trip for the signal and that translates into low latency which is appreciated for a, a lot of applications and also seem to be uh, performing at higher speeds that remains to be seen can they hold up these multi hundred megabit speeds when there are tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of users trying to share the same system. 
to be determined. But we thought, well, yeah, this is interesting. And there are, you know, we've been working with wireless for the last six, seven years towards reaching the more remote places. We, we launched the TV white space initiative some years ago because it had the capability that that TV open frequency in the TV band to travel farther out to, to reach places that are really difficult to, uh, to reach. The thing that struck us about this particular uh, system, which I would offer as a new type of infrastructure, uh, is it, it flips the traditional economic model of, of uh, traditional infrastructure, which says that you know the farther you away are from the, the, the core system, whatever it is, the more costly it is to deliver services. You have to build it out and you know, maintain it and all that. In this case, the cost of delivery is essentially the same anywhere. It's just up and down. Well, up and then across and down. Uh, but that means that, you know, <laughs> that it flattens that. It, it disrupts that cost model. So how do, you, how do you build that? How do you charge for it? How do you regulate it, limit it, manage it? Lots and lots of questions. And we thought, well, libraries are just really excellent community laboratories to test those kinds of things and see how they actually, uh, uh, how, it, how it performs. Uh, there's a concern, though they've agreed to uh, help us set these up, uh, the first few, there's a concern that if you have an aggregated site, that it will then consume uh, a disproportionate amount of the bandwidth and that that will then uh, degrade the, the service for everybody else in that cell, a cell being an area where the satellites crisscross and provide constant coverage. So that's another test. Uh, another thing that we hope to test is well, what's the impact both on the library? Will more people come there? Will it change the applications that the library can offer? Will more people in that area subscribe to the satellite service because they've been exposed to it? Similar to the way many people uh, subscribe to broadband in the uh, in the late 90s after going to a library and experiencing fast downloads and, and streaming media and they go wow whatever that is I don't care what you call it I don't don't talk about bit rate and, and straws and fire hoses whatever that is I want that and I want it at home and that's a kind of a role that libraries have played for a long time as a kind of a demo site for emerging consumer information technologies you know we can go back to books for example and then first generation broadband and so forth. So that's that's a natural role for libraries to drive demand for for interesting new things. And that's been our advocacy is that they see themselves as early adopters and look for opportunities to act as experimenters on behalf of their communities. And so that's what this this particular project is about. The first one is up and live now at uh, the Torreon Community uh, Library in uh, New Mexico. And this is the quote, they've been up for a couple of weeks now and they're pretty happy about it. They, like a lot of people in these remote regions were only connected with uh, a geostationary link. That's in a lot of places, that's all you can get. That's all you can do that are so far out. And so now they're, they're using this and they're the actual first one in the world to have that. So we think that's pretty cool. Uh, we, we hope that this technology can actually finally achieve the goal we've been talking about for decades, well, at least one decade, uh, about connecting everybody. And, uh, and that's everywhere. So there, you know, there are some three, three and a half billion people in the world that are not connected to the internet because they're just not profitable. Well, maybe they'll, maybe they won't all be connected, but they'll have a place they could go nearby, like a library. Uh, this is this is my setup here for our, our talk today, and uh, I pull this from, of course, the internet uh, as a definition of the IoT, controlling the physical real world. Notice how many modifiers there are in that real world, the physical real world, not just the physical world, not just the real world, not just the world, but the physical real world. Um, we need to say these because we have this digital environment that we have to also treat as real and physical. Um, but as I'd mentioned earlier, it poses all these different kinds of challenges. So we're seduced by the power of technology, but we, we just automatically buy into things we don't really know what we're buying. And that translates into these kind of vulnerabilities. So let's get to it. And uh, I want to welcome uh, Deb and Ellen. Uh, 
here for the first time. And we're going to turn it over to Deb Sosha to tell us about what she's been doing for the last two years in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which itself is a, uh, uh, a fascinating story of a community uh, that is that has taken its own fate into its hands and is thriving because of it. And so Deb, welcome and tell us what's up and what you're doing. Sure thing, I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see if I can do this successfully. All right. That look right. Well, loading. All right. Here we go. Good. So, uh, thanks, Don. Uh, I am here in Chattanooga. We like to call ourselves the gig city because we have fiber to the home for everybody in our entire electric footprint. That is provided by our electric power board, EPB for short. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about some smart city projects we're engaged in, some of our challenges and successes, some issues around data and data security, and some ideas for how libraries might participate. So I'm a practitioner in this space. I'm a person who's actually working on these projects in our city. And so my, my bias is focused on that practitioner effort. So I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, and as Don said, I am the CEO of the Enterprise Center and we're a nonprofit partner to the city and county. And our mission is to unite people, organizations and technology build an advanced and inclusive future for our community. We have three areas of focus, community connectivity and digital equity, innovation district programming and smart community collaborative. And just briefly on the digital equity side, because we do have fiber to the home here in Chattanooga, um, we really care deeply about ensuring it's equitably used. So we, we had a significant number of people not connected. And as the pandemic came around, we actually, uh, stood up a project uh, with a lot of partners uh, to connect every single school child who is participating in the school lunch program. That's 30,000 children we are connecting. So we are effectively eliminating the, um, the homework gap here in Chattanooga. And they are getting 100 megabits symmetrical at no cost to the family for the next 10 years. So it is kind of nice to be able to say that and, and to find out how that impacts our families. We actually are doing research on it. And so we'll talk more about that as our research comes out. But we also work on, on digital equity through a program we call Tech Goes Home. And we provide technology training and help to sign up for low cost access. And we've supported 5,000 people through that program as well. Our work on the innovation district is really about uh, advocating for opportunities for entrepreneurs we activate the district and create opportunities for people to learn, connect, support, network, all of the above. I'm really here today to talk about our Smart Community Collaborative. Uh, we coordinate and convene this collaborative here in Chattanooga. You can see some of the logos of the members, uh, the city, the county, EPB, our utility, they, they provide both electricity and internet access. Uh, Erlanger and Siskin, who are, those are local hospitals, CoLab, which is an incubator uh, for entrepreneurs, the University of Tennessee, our local public transportation, there's a whole bunch of members of this collaborative. And our mission is to cultivate an ecosystem of academia, industry, and community to develop and apply innovative solutions to authentic challenges in Chattanooga, while leveraging our community assets in order to thrive in the new economy. We have three areas of focus. One is health. We hope to foster development of cutting edge medical technologies that improve outcomes or extend life. In energy, we wanna le leverage the technology and modeling analysis to achieve improvements in resilience, reliability, security, affordability, flexibility, and sustainability. And for transportation, we hope to improve traffic flow while achieving safety and minimizing environmental impact. Dr. Tippy from the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga uh, opened, started, and directs the Center for Urban Informat Informatics and in Progress here. I'm going to show you a quick video of that. 
see if I can make this work. It's a short video, but it's really kind of neat because you get to see some of the technology. Cities and also the regions around them increasingly face challenges because of growth. One of the challenges, for example, is to get people from A to B. In a smart city, decisions are made based on good data. If you make it to a meaningful information, now that can be used for making smarter, wiser decisions to improve people's life. That's the reason we actually opened CYP at UTC. We are focused on creating solutions that we can export it to other cities like Nashville, Memphis, Tullahoma, and other regions in the state of Tennessee. CYP has been focusing more on three areas of energy, health, and mobility. The MLK Smart Corridor is a smart city and autonomous vehicle testbed. Currently, the testbed is being used for pedestrian safety projects. The project that my team has been working on deals with taking in 911 accidents so we can see where and when accidents are happening and why. Getting this opportunity with my research, it's amazing. I wouldn't have ever thought I could do many of the things that I've already done. I get to see what the world can be. With more funding, we can work on more projects. We can address more challenges. We can hire more students and hire more faculty and researchers that they can work on these problems. It will help us uh, keep the infrastructure that we rely on for the research up to date and modern. And it will help us attract people from the outside who want to work with us. We see the testbed as a sandbox, as a sandbox that we can try a lot of different projects there, which the result of those can be expanded to other part of the city, to other part of the region. It means fewer traffic accidents, fewer health issues like strokes, and a smarter use of energy resources. This is a real research that can be implemented in Tennessee and beyond that can actually have a real impact on people. Great. Not letting me. I'm going to stop sharing and start sharing again so that I can get the other screen back. Not sure why that did that. Deb? Give me just We're not second. seeing you, Deb. Sorry about that. Sorry. Right. For some reason, it did not allow me to go back to my video i mean my to my powerpoint so give me just a, sh a second here okay no problem yeah you know and i mentioned to you i was so pleased because i tried it out and it worked Isn't it that did all? Work. It's a great video yeah the video worked, but now i'm having trouble to get back to my... share and reshare yep um so sorry. Okay, I'm gonna go on and talk. And okay, great. So this collaborative that we are running works together incredibly well. So you heard about the research happening on the sensorized corridor through our town. We actually wrote a grant to build that out, but we didn't get the grant. <laughs> but we still were able to build the corridor because the city worked on installation, UTC worked on mapping and data analytics. Our utility provided electricity and backhaul and our team, uh, along with some sociology support from UTC, really helped to talk to the community about what we were doing. So we were able to build the corridor for far less money than we would have had to pay if one of those entities had tried to do that work. I'd like to note though, Although we didn't get that grant, we have gotten 150 million in research dollars in the past five years. So we oh, no. <laughs> so Dr. Sartipi is the expert here, but I'm going to share some basic information about some of the projects the collaborative is engaged in. Uh, we received a grant that allowed us to place 50 air quality sensors in our community. The grant was uh, through US Ignite. And we're looking to research the relationship between COVID transmission and the level of particulate matter in certain parts of our city. 
We'd like to know if those who are infected and live in areas of high particulate matter actually have more serious outcomes from COVID as well. So the, I'm going to talk about three other winning projects, award-winning projects that are led by the Center for Urban Informatics, but with members of our collaborative and as part of the collaborative. The first one is the digital twin, which is really fascinating. Uh, with lots and lots of data and with some help from Oak Ridge National Labs, we created a simulation of our traffic. So we have a virtual traffic pattern and it allows us to try out different scenarios virtually that would let us see the impact on traffic patterns before we try them out in the community. So testing virtually is cheaper, less disruptive, and yields quicker results. The next thing we worked on is uh, predictive analytics that allow us to analyze, predict, and prevent car accidents. So it uses historical records for car accidents, roadway configurations, other data sets to predict where and when accidents are likely to occur. So, and the project learns over time, which is pretty awesome. Having this information allows us to know, for example, on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock in the rain, where might an accident happen, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and what that's allowed the city to do is reallocate resources and assets, make changes in the location, like a speed bump, a yield sign, a traffic light. And we actually moved a utility pole in one intersection and it resulted in a great reduction of accidents. So it's pretty awesome to be able to do that. It has been uh, published in a, in a peer reviewed journal and I will share that information with you Don afterward. The pedestrian safety project is pretty cool too and it has the potential to make our city safer for pedestrians and you heard the young man in the video talk about that. With LIDAR, LIDAR and sensors um, in collaboration between UTC, the city and county, we were able to create a pretty accurate 3D representation of the physical environment. And the goal here is to collect su sufficient information to inform city planning decisions. I've actually seen some of the data with this and, and what's really interesting is knowing where people cross the street, right? If it's in the middle of the block, is there something we can do different because that's where they're gonna cross, right? So thinking about those kinds of things are very important. But how we collect information and what we do with it is important. Um, we want the community informed and we want them to trust we we'll do what we say. We uh, always uh, inform the community prior to implementation about what we're going to collect, what we're not going to collect, and why we're collecting it. So I'm sure we've all heard projects where um, you know located in cities and they ended up being uh, vandalized and destroyed. In fact, one city I know purchased those big belly trash cans and placed them in an, in an urban setting. But they didn't tell anybody what they were and what data was being collected. And the community destroyed them because bad actors in the community, I shouldn't say the community, but they thought the trash cans were spying on them, right? So, and if they had given people the information up front and talked about it and, and gained some trust in the community, that would have worked. So when we do projects, we talk to the community, we explained all of this information. And what we do is the video that gets collected is very quickly turned into data. So we're not saving video. And you know that I think is very helpful to our community. They are not so worried about it because it's no data. In fact, what happens is uh, things moving through the space are turned into lines that are different colors. So a pedestrian might be pink bicycle might be blue, a car might be green. And it's uh, absolutely fascinating to look at. So they show up as lines and the video, it takes about 30 minutes for the video to convert to that. A lot of it's done with edge computing, but it's kind of cool. We don't do facial recognition and we don't do license plate readers. And so there could be a time when we wanna try out some new project and we'll want to use one of those things. But in that case, we'll go back to the residents and inform them about our reasoning. Uh, we don't share video with police because in fact, we don't have anything to share with the police. The only thing on the corridor that the police have access to are the shot spotters. And that makes sense because that's the intent of those particular So the city of Chattanooga does some pretty amazing work with data as well. And uh, two of those, and I'll send this information as well, are Chattadata's open data pop. 
uh, portal. I can never say that properly the first time I say it. Uh, and their open performance dashboard. And it shows how the city is doing on a variety of stated goals. Uh, the city has this amazing data guru named Tim Moreland, and he's part of the collaborative. He has such a wonderful understanding of data and how it can be used to help with decision making, but also how data could be used to harm. So, you know, for us, the number one thing is we don't want to do any harm with our data collection. It talks about the Tim talks about the unintentional ways data can actually be used to identify people if enough data points are collected. So he talks about it this way. If somebody is identified, for example, as LGBTQ, also identified within a certain zip code and driving a certain car, we could probably figure out who that person is. So he's really good at figuring out how to make sure that doesn't happen. And I appreciate the diligence it requires. And I really appreciate Tim's effort in that regard. The second thing is to really be transparent. For us, that was really important. People are much more likely to support an effort when you explain the purpose and you explain how it will actually help them, that there's a purpose in this, for example, we're going to improve pedestrian safety. And you include information about how you're going to keep that data safe. The third thing is making it easy for people to see the data, use the data, and understand the data, right? So simple graphics that help people understand that. And I think for us, one of the most important pieces about keeping data safe. <laughs> so I know Don mentioned this, but we all know about cities, utilities, and meat processing plants most recently where their data has been taken hostage, right? Um, so uh, one of the things that I think is uh, a high priority is to make sure that you have insurance. And if you are in a library, check with your city and see if you're covered. And if you are not covered, check on, on what you need to do to be covered. Uh, two different cities I've talked to, one had the insurance, the other didn't. Um, the one that had the insurance could actually recreate their data, and the one that didn't, it cost them millions. So, you know, new things, new, new issues we need to worry about require some diligence. I do have a few issues with some of the artificial intelligence efforts and data, and I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't surface a couple of things that I worry about. Uh, one is facial recognition software. Uh, it struggles to really accurately identify people of color. And in particular, it often misidentifies black women between 18 and 30. That's a problem. 83% of companies in the US now use AI to help them with hiring decisions. But sometimes there's an underlying bias in the, in the program. For example, Amazon had to stop using their computer program that they were using to screen candidates uh, because they found it had a bias against women. So, you know, I think people sometimes imagine that decisions made by computers aren't biased, but that really isn't true. And we need to be really careful about that. It concerns me. So we know AI can be really helpful. We know it can cause harm. Um, what did I think? What um, Don asked me to tell you what I thought libraries could do. So first I would say educate, educate yourselves about AI and its impact. Uh, research any AI program within your library and make sure it doesn't have an underlying bias. Pay attention to, in, to um, what kinds of programs are used within your community. Educate the people who use your library about uh, AI. I think one of the greatest values uh, libraries have is their ability to be trusted. They're a trusted resource in the community. And as a trusted resource, uh, you can provide information in a way a lot of other people can people believe that you're giving them the, the truth. Also elevate, so lifting up good stories, sharing bad stories, the more information that you and your teams and people in your community have, the more they'll be able to engage in appropriate ways. Uh, translate. I think when, whenever I have a new application in software and I have that really long thing to read, I have to admit I don't. I think not many of us do. It'd be great if there were a translation of what that actually means. So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a flashlight application for that you could download on your phone, but it collected GPS data. Now, there's absolutely no reason in the world that needed to collect GPS data, but it did. And so that 
information is really hard to figure out and it's helpful when people can help us do that. And then evaluate, does your library have a cybersecurity plan? Do you, does, you know, checking in about the insurance, uh, figuring out whether there are any risks in the, any new software or AI you're thinking of adopting and then figuring out how to mitigate those risks. So although there are risks, I really do believe in the power of machine learning and AI to improve our quality of life. I just want to be skeptical enough to make sure I'm not giving up my privacy or adopting a biased algorithm, either for convenience or in order to participate. So I want to be really cautious about that. So that's it, Don. Wow, Deb, that's a lot. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, uh, uh, you're, you're, uh, I mean, you touched on so many things about the advantages and the application and so forth. And then, of course, the, the point about the, the community trust and the information delivery to gain that. This is not the age where you have much trust in public institutions. Generally speaking, the libraries still hold that in the realms that people see them with as authorities uh, and as uh, places to convene conversations, just like the ones you've been talking about, it, they seem ideal. Uh, you know, they are in the business of informing and they do not seem to have any particular agenda other than that. And uh, so that's a tremendous asset. And, and I think you've made a case that it's an even greater asset now in this age of, I, we don't even know what to call it anymore. It's no longer the information age. It's something beyond that. Um, and in Chattanooga, of course, you have a leading library there. They're, they're real innovators in all kinds of things. But you also have the background that the evolution of the, the, the fiber of the home project grew through the local utility, which is not an outside provider. It's the home you know, electrical system uh, who built a communication system on top of that. So it grew over time. And I can see how you, that would be an advantage as far as gaining trust in the community over somebody says, let's just automate everything. Uh, you also make great points about uh, inbuilt biases in algorithms, uh, which I think is a perfect setup for Ellen. And uh, uh, I'm reminded, Ellen, that when we were first talking and you, you know, we were talking about these interdependencies of, of infrastructures and how embedded ICT would be in everything. I mean, you'd You'd put it in, in the roads, you'd put it in the grid, you'd put it in everywhere. And, and so that made me think, well, does that, make, does that make it a kind of a meta infrastructure? You know, the ring that binds them all? Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, but that's, that increases the complexity so much. Uh, and so you try to manage complexity with machine learning type tools and then you really don't know what might be embedded in those. How do you test those? I think you're gonna get into a lot of that right now. So uh, welcome, Ellen. Uh, it's great to see you. And tell us about public algorithm, algorithmic governance. This is, this is deep, but thank you for, for appearing and you're on, Ellen. Thanks, um, am I, is my screen sharing? Uh, it's not in play mode, but we're sharing fine. Yeah, okay. Um, great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm afraid, Don, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be talking about all those things. Um, but um, it's, uh, I, I do think, though, that, that what I, a couple of things I did want to talk about follow perfectly from, from where Deb left off. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, I'm a library lover. I've, I've written aspirationally about um, the role I think libraries can play in um, it's, it's for broadband policy and, and broadband provision. Um, right now, it seems that all, I do a lot of Washington policy work and all discussions lead to libraries, whether we're talking about disinformation or algorithms. And I think it is um, because of what Don, you said and, and what Deb said is that libraries are sort of, you know, the last institution standing um, that has kind of broad public trust. And so, you know, I'm really interested to hear from you all about ways that can be um, deployed, but also ways that can be preserved. And I think that in the algorithmic kind of smart city place uh, space, um, it's a very delicate balance because, um, you know, the, the, the 
the more that libraries do, the more danger there is um, that they lose that trust. And so let me just talk about that. And I guess, you know, some of the things that Deb said um, that uh, I think fit in really nicely to what I want to talk about are, you know, she talked about leveraging assets, about smart collaboration, um, public-private partnerships, data sharing. So these are all positive things. Um, and they are all fraught things. Or they, I'm sorry, they can be positive, but they can also be very fraught. And so, um, you know, I think what we need to sort of get to the bottom of in algorithmic governance is to uh, engage the public and um, engage the, all the stakeholders, the, the um, frontline workers in the public sector who are deploying these algorithms, who are gathering data, who are entering into procurement agreements. Um, about the risks of algorithmic decision systems, uh, about the risks of data sharing, um, and also about their benefits and um, uh, how do we minimize the risk. So, um, you know, I'm assuming that this audience, everyone has a pretty good um, uh, sense of what public algorithms or algorithmic decision systems um, and, I, you know, th these are also smart city applications, so it doesn't really matter what you call them, but they're essentially um, uses of, of data analytics to produce some sort of uh, result, whether those are um, school assignments or, as Deb was talking about, traffic and right-of-way management. And I just, you know, I mean, the digital twin is a perfect example of how all of these terms have multiple valences. And so, you know, it's a terrific tool to do, you know, to just the kind of prototyping and um, modeling that she mentioned. Um, and it's also a tool uh, to, to profile people and um, uh, whether, whether facial recognition is used or not, um, you know, because of what she mentioned about the ease of, of identifying people. Um, and so it also has you know, it's sort of, we have to be very cautious about digital twins. And I think there's a lot of mistrust. And so that's my particular focus is what role can libraries play? And really, I pose this as a question. Um, uh, I have some notions, but I have no idea if they're rooted in reality. And I think our task um, really, you know, I think researchers task is to hear from libraries about um, uh, what might be possible. Um, and, and so just in this list, you know, I think there are some fairly low risk uh, pedestrian, I might say, um, applications that, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of sort of governance energy on, for example, pipe inspections or, or you know, whether or not a, a, um, uh, a um, utility pole should be moved a few feet because of traffic accidents. Those are perfect examples. Um, of fairly low risk applications of public algorithms. And then of course, policing priorities is a pretty high risk and high stakes um, application. And so, you know, as we think about governance, um, we wanna spend more energy and time in the high risk um, and, and all of the governance uh, sort of, you know, you're seeing a lot of kind of governance efforts and um, plans coming out of jurisdictions all over the world, they're all kind of starting with a kind of risk assessment format um, that that tracks, uh, you know, sort of where are, vulner where, are, where are communities vulnerable to misuse, what is the kind of data that's being collected and shared, um, et cetera. Uh, so in thinking about that and thinking about those risks, um, you know, these are some of them, and then there are others, and then I'll move on to, you know, the role that I think libraries might be able to play in mitigating some of these risks. Uh, so, of course, there are many stories about unfairness and bias, the sort of garbage in, garbage out um, uh, applications, um, especially in the criminal justice system, uh, but increasingly in other, in other sectors as well. So that's um, one set of concerns. Also, you know, data sharing. So, you know, again, you know, Deb, while, while clearly recognizing some of the risks here, you know, I think the narrative, the smart city narrative is one of breaking down silos between um, public uh, departments, uh, pub, uh, um, government departments that hold data and that use it in very different ways. And you get a lot of efficiencies and gains when they share data. And that's undoubtedly true. Um, and it is very hard. I appreciate Deb saying that that um, the, the program she was talking about did not share 
data with the police because they didn't have data to share. Um, you know, there are a lot of examples. You know, one that comes to mind is the San Diego streetlight um, kind of debacle where data was being shared with the police um, and not it was not publicized that it was being shared. And you know, from what I've seen, it can be very hard um, to cabin data from, the, from law enforcement um, you know, with or without warrants. And so, um, so data sharing is a, is a sort of tricky aspect of this and, um, and definitely a risk to be, to be mitigated or an issue to be governed. Um, what, what I wanna spend the rest of the time talking on really is um, this idea of social license. And so, you know, I really appreciate what Deb said about um, all the work that they do uh, in Chattanooga to kind of inform the, the public and um, make transparent, you know, what data has been collected and how it's being used. Um, and so, you know, we, in, in academia at least, you know, often talk about that as, as gaining social license, kind of a sense of a, a sort of public permission um, and also public comfort with um, uh, the technologies and the um, uh, deployments of those technologies. Um, okay, so, so you know, these, this is a list of, of some of the main um, governance categories that when we talk about algorithmic governance, um, we're often focused on. And most of these, I don't think libraries have much of a role to play, although I could very well be wrong. Um, and so the, the three that I won't talk about are, you know, data stewardship, how does it get managed, who is responsible for it in the in the city or the, the um, uh, in the government. Um, Procurement practices is a big one. How do you deal with private sector companies um, and, and public-private partnerships? And then another big one is accountability and redress. How does the public um, or, or you know, acted upon entities um, hold the algorithmic system to account um, and get redress if there is bad data or bad um, results, bad meaning? biased or inaccurate um, or otherwise unfair, inefficient, right? So, so, so lots of ways it could be bad. Um, so let's put those aside. The two areas where I think, um, and, and Don, I think you alluded to this, is that this is, is, is kind of in the, you know, really in the sweet spot of what libraries do is um, creating social license. And, and by this, I wanna be careful and I think this is a really tricky balance, again, between using library social capital and not draining libraries of their social capital, um, is that I don't think libraries should be in the role of sort of um, marketing uh, whatever their municipality's smart city um, project is and, and kind of selling it to the public, um, but rather, you know, uh, convening the public and helping the public um, come to their own participatory decision about whether this is a technology that they want. Uh, and then the other thing I'll talk about is um, libraries role in, in transparency. Um, so this is this uh, uh, graphic comes from a project in New Zealand, which was um, creating guidelines for trusted data use. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's a nice sort of uh, display of the questions that they found doing workshops that the public was asking about algorithmic decision systems. Um, so just basic questions about why are you deploying this system? I mean, why are you doing this digital twin thing? Like, how is it better than what you did before? Um, better for whom? And, um, you know, what will the data that you're collecting be used for? Um, and then, all of the kind of protection security issues um, uh, including and included in here is, um, you know, can I, can I as an individual correct data that's been, um, so sort of redressability, that redressability issue that's been gathered um, about me. Of course, you know, my own view of this, these questions is that they're a little too focused, understandably, right, on personal data. Um, so as we know, some of the problems or issues here or governance questions really um, concern aggregated data. And, and so sometimes the very personal, can I correct my data um, is a question, but it's not really the only question by any means about um, data exploitation and protection. Um, and then the third category is, um, you know, really central to social license is 
do I do I agree with this, right? Um, and and will I have what opportunities will I have um, as this unfolds and as it develops and as it becomes embedded in systems that cannot yet be foreseen? When can I? Pull, when can we as a citizenry or when can I sort of pull the kill switch and, and stop it? Um, so, so what they did um, in this New Zealand uh, project was, you know, they really had this, this um, using participatory design sort of convened members of the public and, and gave them, um, you know, I think a number of examples that, that um, one was, you know, an example of a young mother who's contacted by a public social ser uh, service agency um, because there was a report filed uh, about her child. And then that combined with other data generated a risk score that just sort of flagged her for intervention. Um, and so the public was asked, you know, I think many questions about, you know, what do you think about this? Um, and what that surfaced was, you know, not surprisingly, and so I, I really like that um, the stakeholders here that were involved were, were sort of the, the um, you know, an ordinary, an ordinary, you know, possibly affected, um, citizen, you know, for families, but also specialists um, uh, who, who um, know the kind of innards of these systems, and then also the frontline providers. So sometimes, you know, we can forget in talking about these systems that um, there are people in the police department, in the, um, you know, children and family services department, social workers, and police officers, and, you know, transportation designers who are actually um, using these systems and have their own concerns about them um, and their own ideas about how they should be audited and adapted and developed. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll just, these raised questions, the citizens were raising questions um, about bias, and um, uh, uh, inclusiveness, both in the in the construction of the um, systems and then um, uh, the deployment of them. Who is deploying them, and you know what do they know? Like, what do we know about these scores in the context of um, uh, social systems and political social systems? Um, and then, you know, I think. Um, is really interestingly and not surprisingly these really fundamental sort of epistemic questions about um, what does the data mean um, and who is going to interpret it and who is going to define context for the data um, uh, came up and there was a lot of uh, suspicion. So I think, you know, the general point here is that there's a lot of suspicion and a lot of very good questions. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the, the the social license question is not how do we make the public comfortable with, or the social license project is not how do we make the public comfortable with X, but how do we involve the public in showing us, whoever us is, that you know X has to be either not at all or in a different way, um, and really engage the public in in um, in asking the right questions and and maybe changing our, our um, the, the, those who are deploying these systems, their conception of um, where the value is and how these things should be constructed. And I think libraries, um, you know, could be central in this, not only in convening the meetings um, uh, and in, you know, doing some of the other tasks that were mentioned, translating, explaining, um, but, but also really in kind of, um, developing expertise in the library um, about some of these questions and, you know, who are the stakeholders that should be brought to bear. I mean, obviously the, the um, uh, you know, the agencies with domain expertise are going to um, have primary responsibility for doing that, but I think that they often are results driven. I mean, there's a there's a strong desire to deploy, um, or maybe an equally strong desire not to deploy. And I think libraries as outsiders can kind of um, act as a, I don't, I don't really want to say check on that, but as a, um, uh, you know, sort of a forum for gaining, sharing, developing other perspectives. Um, and so these are, uh, these, um, you know, will be available for your perusal later, but just some of the public engagement 
you know, questions that yeah, I think arose in these in these New Zealand forums and that you can find in every forum um, uh, that that sort of deals with smart city um, or ADS algorithmic decision system conversations and that the libraries would be in a position um, to frame um, to collect data on them, which is another another role to become a repository for this kind of engagement. Okay, the second issue, and this is only one slide, um, just that I, I wanted to address is transparency, right? So, um, sorry, two slides. Um, and that's, you know, I, in a sense, that's what libraries are, right? They are a transparency machine, um, you know, and a, a source of knowledge, um, and, and in some ways, a source of, you know, democratic accountability kind of writ large. Um, so we don't have a lot of transparency now about algorithmic decision systems. Um, there's nowhere you can go to find out, uh, you know, you can go to Chattanooga and they're very open about what systems they're using. Um, other municipalities are not very open. Um, other municipalities don't even seem to know themselves exactly, you know, which of their divisions are using what kinds of systems, what data they're collecting, who is responsible for it, how data is shared, all these questions, it seems that nobody knows. Um, and so, you know, some of the projects I've been involved with are, are you know, civil society projects uh, to try to start building indices um, of, of public algorithmic decision systems. And so one, um, which is MUCROC, which is a uh, journalism outfit that, that um, focuses on freedom of state, local, and federal uh, freedom of information requests and resulting documents. So, um, we built a database of public algorithms that, you know, sort of invites others to contribute to. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have to say has, has not been robustly <laughs> contributed to since we, um, uh, since we did the initial um, dump of our FOIA um, investigative efforts. Um, so I think there's a limit, right, to these, uh, uh, to some of these ad hoc um, private civil society efforts. Uh, another one that, that we're also involved with is with the, the markup, which is the tech um, journalism outfit. And so it's another, you know, 50 state um, big FOIA push to find out what uh, municipalities and states are up to. Um, and so there have been, you know, some, some really interesting findings from that. But again, it is not at all, um, it's pretty ad hoc and not at all comprehensive. Um, so what might we have and what might libraries be involved with? I mean, again, this is gonna be mostly, um, the, one would think that this would be mostly the, the public um, uh, agencies that are deploying these systems, you know, have principal responsibility for letting the public know what they are using. Um, but I also think that the libraries can have a cross jurisdictional, um, cross uh, agency role in creating an index of um, what data is being collected across different systems, um, what are the use and sharing terms? You know, this is sort of not normative, but just descriptive of what is going on. Um, you know, really important feature of all these systems is, is how are they audited? How are they audited for various things, bias and, and efficacy, um, uh, effect on particular, um, particular communities, uh, how are they audited before implementation? How, how and how frequently are they audited after implementation? Um, what are the redress procedures you know, that I mentioned? Um, and then, you know, in addition to, to indices, I can imagine libraries being involved in, and you know, I'm sure there are good examples where libraries are already doing this and I would so much appreciate um, hearing about those. Um, uh, workshops around the real world implications of um, these systems, you know, being involved maybe in policy development. So as you know, we, we the academic community and um, the NGOs kind of work on best practices and, and guides um, and, and possibly legislation. I, I wouldn't imagine libraries being involved in, in developing legislation, but I could imagine libraries being involved in sort of um, best practice, you know, compilations and, you know, at the very least kind of uh, um, knowledge development uh, and, and curation of uh, best practice efforts. Um, and then finally, you know, and I just, this actually just occurred to me in making these slides is, 
you know, and I'm, I'm thinking about kind of libraries in the maker space and are there ways in which libraries can, you know, have kind of labs and, 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 mod and, and model um, both the benefits of these things. So for example, what else can the digital twin do, right? And, and who should have access to it and what benefits um, would, would, would accrue to that? Um, and, and how could we sort of use the library as a lab to play with that and experiment with it? And that is it. That's a, that's a great closing point, Ellen. And, you know, this is terribly complicated stuff and it's, it's incredibly important. Uh, these are just extraordinarily powerful tools that are being created and are giving and are being given you know, range of, of action or agent, I guess you say, uh, that we don't know quite the impact. Uh, so we can do simulations and we say, well, it probably do this, but you know, we'll have to do it before we find out. Uh, and, and once again, as you've both made the point, the, the library seems to see kind of just drifting to the center of the conversation about across, you know, not the deep uh, field of machine learning so much as the application and the public benefit, the public risk. And so where do you turn for all this? One, one thing that struck me, Debbie, you were talking about, you know, reading the, uh, the, the terms of agreement, you know? Yeah, okay, if you can actually read it. And, and of course you don't, you just click on it. Because if you do read it, you'll see at the bottom it says, we reserve the right to change these, you know, at will. So what did you actually agree to anyway? Just, you know, don't hurt me is kind of what you're hoping. And we're all kind of in this frame of mind. The other thing that struck me is the backdrop for everything you've talked about is uh, a kind of an open society. And that's one type, but it's not the only type. There are lots of societies, there are lots of governments out there that are not interested in, in the issues that you've uh, both uh, raised so, so well. Uh, I don't know what the impact is. I mean, we're talking about a global interconnected world. So those infrastructures are part of our infrastructure and vice versa. Uh, that seems another level of, of complexity. I guess we can just fall on that every time we don't know what we're talking about. Uh, uh, but the the notion that the library can play the role not of the expert field expert, but with enough general understanding to facilitate a conversation, and and bridge uh, information between experts and the lay public, which itself is a phenomenal challenge. We put up a graphic. Speaking of graphics, we put up a graphic. They did a, a survey a few years ago after a, a, a release of a Jurassic Park movie. And they ask how many people believe that people and dinosaurs lived at the same time. And it was really interesting, the result. It was only 25% of the total population was sure that they did not. Others that they absolutely did, or maybe they did, or maybe they didn't, but only 25% were sure they did not. So how do you how do you have a conversation with a level of education, information that is so broad? It's a challenge. And I think you're right, librarians, if anybody is up to it, it, it's the librarians. You also make me think that this is, this is, a, this is a, a field of information science that should be being taught in the universities. And I don't know that, but I'm gonna try to find out and see if these areas, which are absolutely relevant to, to, to library work and library policy uh, are actually being discussed and, and taught because it seems like it's a natural fit. So there, uh, Sharon asked about data retention. Sharon Strover from UT, welcome Sharon. Uh, you wanna say anything about what you're thinking there, Sharon? Um, uh, yeah, my video is coming on here. Yeah, um, data can live forever. And uh, we might have some protections in place for the for you know the moment or for creating databases, data data sets, but to the extent that we don't really have many provisions for what one can do with that data later on, the way in which the industry is using the term join data sets. 
uh, together to create the scenarios that that Deborah was was talking about, uh, you know, that can enhance identification and capabilities, um, various capabilities that were unanticipated initially. The whole issue of you know where data ends up and who has access to it and what it ends up being used for, I think has to be on the table too. Okay, great. That's on the table. This is kind of our. Our, we'll, we'll close around this point and, and ask our speakers to respond to uh, Sharon and then, uh, well, just go ahead and say anything about retention that you'd like to, either Ellen or Deb. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it's, it's crucial. All right. Yeah, I think yep. the other piece of this that I, I think a lot about is the right to be forgotten. At some point, I just may not want my data in that data. Yeah. How can I make sure I can remove it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, but I don't think that's going to be possible. Um, yeah. I mean, that, you know, it, it, and I think like it's really important, and maybe this is a role libraries can play. And I, it was my critique of one of the slides I used is that it's still a little bit rooted in this personal, you know, consent model. And I just, you know, I, I, I don't think. I think that that libraries can play a role in helping to educate the public and the and the implementers that like that ship has sailed and we are not going to be able to claw our data back personal data back once it's once it's, and it, it's going to live forever and so you know it puts a lot more weight on the initial data collection. Um, uh, but Right, but and and people understanding where that data ends up and how long that data ends up there and what what it can be combined with, I think it's it's a little scary. It's totally scary. I mean, the these al behavioral algorithms are getting ever more sophisticated. They're being fed vast amounts of extremely personal information. Uh, you know, our movements, our biases, our friend, all that stuff. That then they can basically analyze us to an extent that we can't analyze ourselves, which makes us susceptible to you know, a lot of manipulation. Uh, we had a, 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 a session on uh, libraries in response to big AI. It was a, it was a really good session. One of, the, one of the concepts that came up was the idea of a trust mediary. Uh, a kind of a personal agent that would negotiate your own your own personal AI that would negotiate with the the other AIs about the terms of use and and uh, uh, storage and the rest of it. So an interesting concept. Uh, if you want to check that out, you can see more at glia g l i a dot net. It's a really fascinating approach. We've got to do something, and we're just we're just diving into it. You know, head first. <laughs> like we do. That's just what we are as humans and monkeys. Um, last word, uh, Ellen, any, anything else you'd like to close with? We're going to wrap this up. We're over a few minutes. That's okay. It's not a TV show. I don't think I have anything. anything to say. All right. All right. You had a lot already. That's okay. Deb, any closing remarks? I would just say that, you know, the work that we've done here in Chattanooga, we're really open to sharing. If folks are interested in learning more about what we're doing and and how we've managed some of these projects, we'd be more than happy to connect and share and and learn from you as well. That's great. Uh, Chattanooga seems to have made a, a, a tourist business out of education on uh, ICT. <laughs> Congratulations and uh, thank you both again. What we'd like to do is ask everybody to unmute if you would unmute everyone, please unmute uh, because if we were together like we would hope to be sometime soon in a, in a conference room or a ballroom somewhere, we would we would give our speakers a hand. And that's what we like to do right now. So everybody, please give our speakers a hand. Uh, that's great. That's great. All right. With that, we will close the recording. Thank you.